Did you do a direct consumer test over the holidays? If you did, you probably got your results recently. Maybe you're confused and scared, what could it mean? Instead of going to Dr. Google, you can speak to a certified genetic counselor. And now I have a new resource for you, DNA Ally. Think of them as your genetic counselor matchmaker. For $79, you can book a 20 minute session with a certified genetic counselor to answer your burning questions. And DNA Ally is giving DNA Today listeners a discount. Use code DNA Today at checkout for 15% off that original $79. So that's only $67 for a session. Replace confusion with clarity. Go to DNAAlly.com and decode your DNA test results. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. On this show, I explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics, such as genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, and patient advocates. Today's episode continues the crossover series with other genetic podcasts. Joining me is Dr. Janina Jeff, who is a human geneticist and the first African-American to graduate with a PhD in human genetics from Vanderbilt University. She's currently a senior scientist at Illumina, which for those that don't know, is a biotech company that creates technology for companies such as Ancestry.com and 23. And me. Her research career was focused on population genetics, specifically studying admixed populations, descendants with African ancestry, and discovering population specific genetic risk factors of common disease. Her podcast, In Those Genes, is a hip hop inspired show that uses genetics to uncover the lost identities of African Americans. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeff, for coming on the show and sharing your expertise. I'm really excited to launch into our conversation. And I want to start with what inspired you to pursue a career in genetics? Yeah, so I um, started to think about genetics when I was in college. Um, when I first got to Spelman, which is where I went to undergrad, I was dead set on being a OBGYN. Uh, my mom was having a baby in her early 40s. Um, and my brother and I were much older. And so I was like, I want to be an OBGYN because she had a lot of complications. And then I saw a cadaver and I was like, nope, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, not long after that, I took a genetics course and I got an A. And that might not, that might sound like a normal thing, but, you know, I had a good time in undergrad. So it was a very abnormal thing for me to get an A in a biology class. I was like, what's going on? And I just really was intrigued and enjoyed it. And then uh, coincidentally, I was in a research program and I joined a research lab. I call it a damp lab, um, the first of its kind back then. So back then, a lot of people did bench work, but this lab in particular was starting to do some computational uh, genetics or what we call bioinformatics. I didn't know it was bioinformatics at the time, but I really enjoyed that. And so we call it a damp lab because it was some parts you know, at the bench and some parts at the computer. So it's that combination of wet lab versus dry lab. So you're coming up with this damp term. I like that. Yeah. So damp, um, yeah, damp, or we call it humid, or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> moist. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed that. And um, at the time, we were working on the bovine genome. And I was doing a project that looked at the association of fetal cow birth weight Um and, and the bovine genome. And so that was my first kind of entry into uh, genetics. And I really like the computational side. I'm not sure if you've done any bench work, but it can be extremely stressful yes. and um, doesn't work all the time. And, and, and computer science is, is tough too, but in a different way. And so that's when I first became interested in genetics. And then I, uh, you know, went to Vanderbilt for my PhD, in which I was in a program that gave like 12 different options. So I actually didn't have a subject going into my PhD, but you are allowed to do rotations and you picked a subject. And I, you know, did a couple of rotations in genetics labs, uh, human genetics labs, and they were all computational. And I quickly became tied to a population genetics project um, with one of the professors at Vanderbilt. And then I've just been, you know, tied into it since. That's really interesting that you started wanting to maybe go into 
um, like OB side. And then one of your first projects was actually looking at like fetal and, and pregnancy. So it kind of came around in the end there. Yeah, like it definitely came around. Um, I, you know, I would say another thing that was so, uh, so uh, appealing to me was this connection to the community. Um, so looking at populations like I was completely tied to all of the other bench projects were, you know, very uh, far away from what we call the bedside. Um, but like a lot of the projects that I was working on were like what we call base pair to bedside, right? So it was like, I have an opportunity to work on things a little bit closer um, to the patients and a little bit closer to kind of like statistics and computer science, which I was becoming extremely interested in. And I just like that. It was like a complete direct personal connection um, to the community and the science that I was doing. And you don't often get that in research. It is usually very like separate. You're working on research and it's such a long haul before this information actually benefits patients directly. So it's a, a cool concept that you're able to really have that more integrated and it sounds like sped up compared to other types of research. Yeah, exactly. And that was one of the things that like really appealed to me um, was to be able to, you know, be very, uh, to get a skill set that I could apply very broadly um, that being the computer science and the statistics and then being able to do things like, um, in our program, average PhD students publish at least five papers. Whoa. Is that normal? I don't know how many papers usually PhD students publish. I'm very much in the masters of science world. Yeah. So typically you need one publication in order to most, most schools, it's one publication in order to, uh, graduate. But um, in the computational sciences, you know, you probably get your first paper in the first two years. That's probably the hardest thing, your first paper. But once you get your first paper, there's so many papers that come after it. And at that time, you know, computational genomics was still fairly new. And I'm not sure if you talked about GWAS on your, on your, um, on your podcast yet. But Yeah, we've mentioned it before. You can explain what that means. Yeah. So uh, these genome-wide association studies, which was a method that became increasingly popular after uh, the sequencing of the human genome and really popular after we started to create technology, genotyping array technology that enabled us to kind of assay the entire genome. And so the idea is that it's hypothesis free. Um, you don't come in with any type of prior biological hypotheses in the genome. And so you're actually asking every variant that represents a, a region in the genome if it's associated with the disease trait or phenotype. And so um, at this time, you know, I kind of referred to this moment when I was in graduate school back to when people were like discovering and sequencing genes, because you would find all these papers that someone like sequenced one gene, right? Or a paper when someone discovered a new variant. And that was the paper. That's all it took. It was so um, focused. It wasn't wide scale. It was this particular point. But everyone was so excited about this technology and just about the idea in general, right? And so the same thing kind of happened with GWAS. And I kind of came in at that time where GWAS were really taking off, becoming widely accepted and um, widely used. And so we were, you know, in that generation of, ah, I, I published the first GWAS on X and the first GWAS on Y. And, and so, and the field moves really fast because that was only uh, almost, you know, this was probably seven to 10 years ago. Um, and now, you know, to publish a GWAS on anything would just be kind of like, you know, been there, done that. And so, um, yeah, so, I mean, that was, kind of the thing like we were produ producing a lot of science really quickly uh really fast and it was amazing and a lot of this genetic research especially with GWAS studies that we're talking about has really advanced precision medicine but one of the main things that we're going to talk about on this episode is that most research is with European genomes and I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about how a more diverse research pool can continue that scientific progress and why we really need this so badly. Yeah. So um, a lot of things, a lot of the research has been with European genomes. And um, the reason why we need diverse genomes, well, there's one obvious reason is that 
when we're looking at diseases that affect rural populations, we need to make sure we have representation of rural populations. And so um, that's kind of like the obvious thing. Uh, to dive a little bit deeper into the science, if you think about um, if you think about a European genome, Europeans are, are a much more recent population compared to an African population. And so African populations are the oldest populations, and they've had a lot of time to accumulate mutations for survival. And so let's say we were looking at one gene, and in an African population, we might see a thousand mutations, whereas in a European population, we might only see uh, 500. And so when we have uh, a population that has a thousand mutations, and let's say the first GWAS was done in a European population where there was only 500, we might see an association in a European uh, population that, rep that kind of like has a flashlight and says, hey, something's going on here, right? And um, as a scientist, we know, you know, that flashlight being like a statistically significant result, we can go there and say, hey, wh what's going on? But the flashlight is not really giving us uh, a lot of insight to exactly where. So imagine like a flashlight just pointing at you. You can't really see anything that's behind there. You just know something is there. Uh, with an African genome, because they have, have a lot more mutations, you have way better resolution, right? So instead of like a flashlight pointing at you, you might think of this as, um, I mean, this was maybe not the best example. No, I'm following it. I like it. You might think about instead of a flashlight, you have a street light or something that's like um, still lighting an area, but in a way in which you can see everything. And so you can go specifically to the area that is associated with disease. And so having multiple mutations or having a lot of mutations allows us to localize a variant of interest. And so in a more recent population, we're, we're not able to localize it because there hasn't been enough time to break down exactly which mutation is associated with the disease. But with an older population, um, it's been around for a long time. So, you know, it's evolved and those mutations have developed, you know, for survival mostly. Um, but the ones that are associated with disease were able to localize to a very specific signal. And so when we think about doing GWAS in European populations, um, we may not have a lot of resolution. But that's, you know, that's, that's another reason. Um, one, other uh, one other reason that could explain this is that we just have differences and uh, different variants that are associated with different diseases in different populations. So this kind of gets into personalized medicine, right? This idea that our end goal is to develop um, research that is specific to a person um, and we're getting there, but in this context, we're developing uh, research or medicines and treatments that are specific to populations. And, and this is based off of, you know, things that we've observed between the genome and um, these populations. And so in this context, you would think, you can think about there are certain mutations that are seen in certain populations. A lot of times this is a reflection of the environment, whether that be an environment for a couple of hundred years ago that's unique to this population or an environment that, or a mutation that might've arised even more recently. And so there is a very strong hypothesis that, you know, the variants of interest are just different and to justify, you know, or to, to look in different populations to see what those differences are is exactly what we should be trying to accomplish with personalized medicine. So with personalized medicine, we want to make sure we know the right mutation for the right population to develop the right therapy at the right time. And we have to expand that beyond Europeans to represent global populations because obviously, you know, diseases and, and things like that affect all of us. I think that those are fantastic points and that even within different diseases, if we look at a disease like say cystic fibrosis, that it's more common in the European uh, populations but anyone can ha be a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And the research we have is a lot of the variants that are occurring in the European populations. And so when some people get this genetic testing, 
they may not be able to say if they find a variant, oh, what exactly is this? Because our research is not that expansive for non-European populations. So that's a, another kind of good point to, to tie into all the great points that you're bringing up. Exactly, exactly. So we need to be able to up all of this research. And, and another uh, aspect that I wanted to, to bring up is you wrote a fantastic piece called 46 Chromosomes in a Mule. And you talked about, I'm sure a lot of people saw this when it was coming out, especially if you're following genetic news, that Ancestry had a horrendous advertisement that romanticized slavery. And I wanted to get your take on how genetic testing companies can be more culturally competent because they're really dropping the ball. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not just genetic companies, right? Um, we've seen a lot of these failures with, uh, was it Gucci this year that had a blackface, um, H and M that had a, a little black boy as a monkey. So we've had, there's been a lot of, a lots of these, um, these mishaps. And I think the short answer to the question, the short answer to this is that we have to be very inclusive um, diverse, yes, but inclusive. And so inclusive in this context means that having uh, people of color or women or uh, people from the LGBTQ plus community present is not just enough, right? That's one step. So having someone there is one step. That's representation. Um, and having ideally someone that represents every group is diversity, not just non-white. But inclusion is when you actually empower the people that are there to speak up and to give feedback. And I think that is what's missing. So I think now people think that, oh, diversity is non-white. And so having just one, you know, Asian man in the room is considered diversity. Well, that's not actually diversity, right? Because the world doesn't look all white with one Asian man. So having diversity is like having that really global representation in the context of marketing, if you're doing an ad targeted towards a group or if you're trying to increase or you are trying to market to a particular group, that's who should be developing the marketing material, having those folks there. But I'm sure you've experienced this as a woman in the workplace. And so have I, you know, a lot of times it can be intimidating to be in a room where you're not often included. So how do we not only have people there how do we empower them and let them know that this is a safe place for them to speak up? Now, this wasn't the case with the Ancestry commercial. There were, to my knowledge, af after doing a lot of research, there were no black people that were involved in the production of it, except for the actress. But if we had someone there and we also empowered this person to speak up, I do not think this commercial would have seen the light of day. Um, so that's one. And we also need to have diversity, diverse and diversity and inclusion at the decision making level. So who are who's making the decision to green light this? Um, that needs to be talked about, too, because having, you know, have including diverse folks at the production stage at the bottom is great. But also having someone to clear this off is is extremely important. Um, one of the things that I think in terms of, so that's a way to be more culturally inclusive, but to speak more broadly, and you didn't ask this question about, um, so I'm just going to ask it, but you didn't ask this question. Go for like, it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that a lot of the genetic testing companies, I think the one thing that they miss in terms of participation with uh, non-white participants worldwide is transparency because there's a lack of trust for various groups, for various different reasons. But I think that people become more trusting the more transparent you are with them. I recently, um, we recently, um, well, we have an episode come out where we talk about what you can do with your genetic data after you get it from um, a commercial testing company. And we talk about one of my favorite companies, uh, DNA Land. And one of the things I really liked about DNA Land and their website and just using uh, just using their their um, their tool is that they're completely transparent. You know, they report genetic ancestry and they give full disclosure that you know there's no way to possibly you know 100% accuracy accuracy know someone's genetic ancestry, which is true. Um, they're very transparent about what the disease associations mean. They're very transparent about the fact that a lot of their things have not been, you know, uh, inclusive of world populations. They're just honest. 
And me as a user, I'm like, well, I understand all the caveats, but I appreciate them as a company way more for at least telling me. And I think once we kind of start being more honest and more transparent, then we can start to build trust and those things will change, right? So like, hey, we're not doing great right now because we don't have a lot of people. So take these results and interpret them as such. But as you come and as you start to participate, you know, it helps everyone. And that, that's kind of the message that we need to convey versus like, hey, there's no black people, so let's recruit black people. That That's not the message, you know, everyone's intelligent enough to understand these things. And I think we, if we're more transparent, we'll definitely want to be um, engaged more. And having people be more of a partner in this research and less of, oh, we, we need more samples. So please send in your samples. Like, okay, let's work together. If we can collect more samples of non-European populations, we can increase all of the different data we have on those populations to then include it in these types of tests. And have that information come back to the users so that it is this cycle and it's more of a partnership rather than just being like a research participant. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, one of the things I like about 23andMe is they call their, their, um, their customers collaborators. Uh, we did an interview with them, uh, that, you know, just came out, um, and they, you know, talk really, they talk really inclusive in that way, scientifically inclusive. And I think that I, I think that that messaging is the exact kind of messaging that we need to do. Um, we need to make sure that everyone's active and engaged and that they are collaborators. You know, I tell people all the time, everyone is a scientist. Everyone is a scientist. Um, everyone is a statistician. You know, we don't have to make these uh, these titles seem so far fetched or, or so elitist, if if you will. And we were talking earlier about um, looking at research from this population genetics standpoint, and um, I was interested to learn more about um, how population geneticists have observed an increased amount of African ancestry on the X chromosome in African Americans. Can you explain what this means and, and how we're starting to use this information? Yeah. Um, so basically what this means is if we were, so one way we can look at where um, a lot of genetic ancestry is coming from that could be parent specific, right? Um, and in this context, I was referring to uh, the ancestry ad that assumed that the black woman was in love with this white man. And that, and that was the, that was the history um, but if we look at it scientifically, if we were to look at males, so males get their Y chromosomes from dad, and they get uh, half of their X chromosome content from mom and the other half from dad, right? So you can see um, parts of the X chromosome. Um, you can look at genetic ancestry on the X chromosome. And what we've seen recently in black males is that they have increased African ancestry on the X chromosome, which would mean that their uh, mothers are, are black compared to their Y chromosome, which is largely European ancestry. And so that's a hypothesis that we've seen consistently. Um, there's a paper that talks about this from, I believe it's Ancestry on the Great Migration. It's actually one of my favorite papers ever in life. <laughs> we'll have to link to that in the show notes then, definitely. Yeah. It's an amazing paper, but it, they they observe an increased amount of African ancestry uh, on the X chromosome, and they're focusing on a region of the X chromosome that's only being inherited from mom. Um, so in the X chromosome, you you uh, you have uh, parts of the X chromosome that we call um, PAR, and uh, PAR stands for oh my goodness, uh, what is PAR? Stand Testing for? my knowledge as well. Something something region. <laughs> Uh, pseudo autosomal region. There it is. Yeah. And, uh, the, so we're not looking at the pseudo autosomal region because the pseudo autosomal region would look just kind of like the idea of that is that it kind of mimics the, the autosomes. Right. But if we look at kind of like those sex specific regions and then we can look at that and say, okay, well, there's increased African ancestry on the X chromosome in black males and compared to, um, compared to most. So their way we can assume that there's African ancestry coming in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think we are able to see a lot from looking at how things are inherited, especially in terms of which parent that's being inherited from and talking about the 
Y chromosome being only passed down through males. And so usually when I think of looking at like population genetics, I'm thinking of the Y chromosome. So it's interesting that it's also really important to be looking at the X chromosome for both of those uh, views. Yeah. So the reason why people look at the Y chromosome, so the Y chromosome, we can do Y haplotype mapping. And so um, a lot of genetic ancestry companies, they do sometimes um, an older technology is looking at haplogroups. And so haplogroups are these idea that chunks of a particular chromosome are coming from a particular origin um, at a given time. So for example, there are Y haplogroups that represent groups within Africa, groups within Europe. Europe, within Asia, and so forth. And so back in the day, before we started looking at genetic ancestry at the genome-wide level, we only focused on um, two kind of major uh, haplo haplogroup groups, if that makes sense, or like uh, two major kind of ways of, of, of uh, analyzing genetic ancestry. So one of them is uh, Y chromosome haplogroups, and that way we can only look at that in men, because men have Y chromosomes, we can only look at in men, and we can say, you know, we can make genetic ancestry predictions whether your Y uh, chromosome haplo haplotypes match a haplogroup that we've seen from a particular area in the world. So it's still this idea of matching your genome or part of your genome with a reference. And then um, for women, we would look at mitochondrial haplogroups. And actually everyone, uh, male or female, can look at mitochondrial haplogroups. And so there's a company, African Ancestry, and they offer they still offer these tests. I believe Family Tree or MyHeritage, one of them still offers this test as well, um, in addition to the genome-wide test. And so what they're doing with the mitochondrial haplogroup, which is a little bit more, I would say, a robust compared to the Y chromosome, um, just because you uh, you have weight, you have a lot more mitochondrial haplogroups in the world because they've been studied a bit more, and you can actually trace these further back. The problem with both of these technologies is that they're somewhat ancient. So you're looking at uh, ancestry two thousand years ago, and most people, I'm sure, you know, are not really interested in what happened two thousand years ago, and particularly Black folks, we're more interested in what happened, you know, four hundred, five hundred years ago, right? And so um, looking at sex chromosome haplogroups, mitochondrial haplogroups, or Y chromosome haplogroups, you won't get that resolution of more recent ancestry. And so we're able to tell a lot from genetics and be able to really create this story of where we've come from specifically, you know, within families and looking at this overall population level of looking at migration. And there's so much information. I mean, we could go on and on about this. Um, and yeah. it's, it's really exciting to hear about and I wanted to, before we end, plug your podcast and, and really congratulate you on winning Spotify Sound Up Bootcamp. I'm so impressed. I mean, you were selected out of 18,000 applicants like that. I mean, that in itself, people should just go listen to it without even knowing what it's about. But um, you launched last month, February 4th. Can you give people a tease? I mean, a lot of topics, kind of what we've talked about, but other topics that you explore on the show, different guests you've had? Yes, of course. Um, so uh, the podcast In Those Genes is a podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories of African descendants. And um, some of the episodes that we've already aired, um, our, our pilot episode um, started with the origin. So this idea of identities we thought was a good place to start. And this episode focuses on me and my parents and my family. And but other things, you know, the the title of the season, similar to um, the op ed piece, is called Forty Six Chromosomes in a Mule, um, to pay homage to the forty six acres and uh, forty acres in a mule that um, slaves were promised after uh, the uh, the abolishment of slavery, and so. The first season is all about direct-to-consumer testing, and we did that because that seems to be the biggest interest uh, in the Black community. Everyone wants to know, is it safe? Um, can we do these tests? And so we address all of these things in the show. Um, we have episodes where I actually you know, use my bioinformatics skills and analyze some of my friends' ancestry results. Um, as I said earlier, we have uh, how-to guides on what to do with your data if you have results. But one of the big things that I think really stands out in this episode is we talk about um, privacy and we we talk about the major companies. We have an interview with 23andMe. We have an interview with African Ancestry. 
um, and uh, a new company called Afro Roots. So we interviewed a lot of the big companies um, to learn about their methods and what they're doing and what they could be doing differently. In addition to, you know, what you can do with your data, how do you protect your data? What are the things you should know? In a very fun way. So the show is hip hop inspired. And so at the top of every show, we have a segment called Genes for the Culture, where I take a genetic concept and break it down using black culture. Um, I poorly did that today when I was talking about the flashlight. And your Not European poorly genes. at all. <laughs> I hope the idea of the point was that was completely off the fly um, for the podcast, though. It's a really highly produced podcast. Lots of music, lots of bells and whistles. It's actually taken us over a year to produce, but I'm really excited. Um, and now that we're live, it, it just feels amazing to have this project into the world, um, to really have, you know, something that exists for people to go to listen to and learn. You know, my biggest goal with this podcast is to make sure that we start to build the bridge between um, communities of color and research. And as I said earlier, empower everyone to dig deep and find the inner scientists within them and find their value um, in their genome. You know, we're not really often talked about in terms of value. That would be another thing I would say about companies. Let's talk about how value we are, how valuable we are. And let's talk about a positive story of how a lot of things that society might have painted as negative from African descendants is actually a very beautiful and positive story. So we're really trying to change that narrative. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, everybody should go subscribe right now and check it out. I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you're definitely interested in all the concepts that you talk about on your show and exploring it. And with a really cool format of being highly produced and obviously Spotify is totally backing you on this of winning the, the sound of boot camp and everything. So I think, I think people have been sold at this point. So thank you so much for coming on the show and exploring all these ideas with me. Um, really looking forward to seeing where the podcast goes and staying in touch with it. Yay, thank you. It was great. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Dr. Jeff. You can listen to much more from her on her own podcast, In Those Genes. It's available on Spotify, Apple, and really all the major podcasting apps. All you have to do is search In Those Genes in your podcast app and take a listen. I highly recommend checking it out. If you are on social media and want to connect and follow them, you can look them up on both Twitter and Instagram. It's the same handle, In Those Genes Pod. POD and the website is in those genes.com where there's even more information. There is over a hundred episodes of this show and they are all available on dnapodcast.com. And you may not know that each episode has a blog post associated with it for more information. Sometimes this is links to articles or studies we talk about. There is images of the guests on there and so much more. You can also follow me on Twitter at DNA Podcast, on Instagram at DNA Radio. Love connecting with you all on there. And any questions for myself or Dr. Jeff can be sent into info at dnapodcast.com. We really like hearing from you and what your thoughts are about the show, if it inspired new way of thinking for you if you come up with additional questions that we didn't get to during the interview that are just burning questions of yours we would love to answer them for you again the email is info at dnapodcast.com don't forget to leave a rating and review on podcast apps i really really appreciate when you can take a couple minutes just to leave a rating and review because other listeners can find it and i also get to see your comments on the show publicly really appreciate that before we end the show, I wanted to remind you of DNA Ally, or as I like to think of them, the Genetic Counseling Matchmaker. They were actually guests on last episode, 116. DNA Ally is helping people make sense of their direct consumer genetic test results, so understanding your results become just as easy as getting them in the first place. You might think, why not just ask my doctor? But to be honest, most doctors don't have expert training in genetic testing. Genetic counselors, on the other hand, have two years of graduate training specifically in genetic testing. I should know, I'm almost done with my degree. If you have questions about your direct consumer test result, like 23andMe or Ancestry, then take this opportunity to speak with a certified genetic counselor for 20 minutes. You can learn about what your results mean for your health and the potential impact to your family members. Since you're a DNA Today listener, DNA Ally is giving you an exclusive discount. Use code DNA Today at checkout for 15% off that original 79. So that's $67 for a session to have your questions answered. Replace confusion with clarity. Go to DNAAlly.com and decode your DNA test results.
Thanks for listening and join me next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.